We're going to talk about pathologies of ADH. First one is diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is a disease with impaired ADH function. And it leads to too much urine output and excessive thirst. That's because ADH normally helps us reabsorb water. But if it's not working, you're going to, pee, you're going to be peeing out all that water. And because you're not reabsorbing water, you're going to be super thirsty. Okay. And that's this too much peeing of water is why you get this name diabetes, which is similar to how diabetes, you have diabetes mellitus, which is from the too much sugar. We're going to talk about that. But this is diabetes. This Again, they're both from too much pee. Diabetes mellitus is too much pee due to, due to too much uh, sugar. So it's like an osmotic diuresis. This one is too much pee due to impaired ADH function. Now, you can have, this can be a problem either due to lack of ADH production or from the kidney not responding to ADH. So lack of ADH production is a central diabetes insipidus. And when the kidney doesn't, you're making ADH, but your kidney doesn't respond to it, that's called nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So what would cause the impaired ADH production or secretion? What would cause central diabetes insipidus? So damage to what organs? Well, it was damaged, remember, ADH was made in the hypothalamus and then stored in the posterior pituitary, so damage to either of those. And that can be from things like uh, pituitary tumor, from trauma, surgery, just damage to these two areas can cause a central diabetes insipidus. Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus can either be hereditary or it can be from drugs. So lithium is a key one to remember. Lithium causes nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. The other one is democlocycline. This is easy to remember. You're going to see this multiple times in this section. But this is an ADH antagonist. So obviously, if you have too much of it, your kidney is it's just going to block the kidney from, from being sensitive to ADH, and then you're going to get problems. So how do we differentiate the two? We, we're going to see a patient with too much urine output, excessive thirst. How do we know whether the problem... And then, Remember, note that for this can actually be a diabetes mellitus problem too, but you would be able to measure the blood sugar. So you see, blood sugar is normal, so you know it's not diabetes mellitus. So is it a central problem? Is, it, is he not making ADH, or is the patient just not, is their kidney not sensitive to ADH? What you do is you do a water deprivation test. Okay, How, what do we do? You obviously you deprive the patient of water. What is the patient going to want to do physiolog physiologically? They're going to want to reabsorb water. Obviously, they're not going to be able to right now because, they're, because their ADH is not working. But what you do is you deprive them of water and then you give them, a, you give them desmopressin. Desmopressin, you're going to see over and over again, again as well as ADH analog. Desmopressin, desmopressin ADH analog. So it acts like ADH. Democlocycline is an ADH antagonist, so it blocks the ADH function. Okay. You give them desmopressin, what's going to happen? If it's central, what's going to happen to urine osmolality? If it's central, you give them desmopressin, which is an ADH analog, your kidney is going to be able to work now. It's going to be, yes, I can reabsorb water. You're going to reabsorb water, you get increased urine osmolality. What happens in in the nephrogenic kidneys you what really want to reabsorb water you give them desmopressin what happens your what happens with your kidney nothing remember the problem whole problem here is your kidney is not responsive to ADH so no change in urine osmolality so that's how you know you look at the urine osmolality after you deprive them of the water and eventually you give them desmopressin okay how do we treat this for central, how do we treat central diabetes insipidus? This is our answer right here. You give them desmopressin, and then, then their kidneys will be able to respond and problem solve. Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, a little more complicated. You give them, di you give them thiazides, NSAIDs, and milliride. Why do we do that? Thiazides cause a sodium depletion by blocking sodium reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubules. And this basically stimulates sodium and water reabsorption in the proximal tubules. So that's how you get increased water reabsorption in the proximal tubules by, by causing a little bit of sodium depletion. NSAIDs help the aquaporins function a little bit better. So whatever aquaporins you do have, NSAIDs help them function better. 
Amiloride is useful as a potassium sparing diuretic, useful for lithium induced nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. You don't have to memorize all these explanations, you could just brute force memorize these. So, thiazides, NSAIDs, amiloride for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and then desmopressin for central. Now, we talked about a, this is a problem with impaired ADH function. Now, we're going to talk about SIADH, which is too much a problem from too much ADH secretion. There's a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. So this is the whole opposite problem. And what's going to happen if you get too much ADH? You're going to get water retention. And if you watch the renal lecture, you, you would know what the problem is here. If you are retaining too much water, what will happen to your electrolyte levels, especially your sodium levels? You're going to get a hyponatremia. It's going to be a euvolemic hyponatremia. And I did a whole talk on hyponatremia differential diagnosis, but this is the very most common cause of hyponatremia in, in your patients, it's going to be SIADH. And why is it going to be euvolemic? Even though we're, we just said we're retaining all this water, why, why is this patient euvolemic and not hypervolemic? It's because you're going to get a trans, this is a whole renal physiology thing. You're going to get, you are going to get a transient increase in extracellular fluid, but what's going to happen? What is going to be the response here? Well, first of all, you're gonna, what's going to happen if you get too much atrial distension? What, what do we say? This is also a cardiac lecture. So it's all very synthesized, very, lots of synthesized. You get increased natriuretic peptide release. Natriuretic peptides, what does it do? It causes diuresis, which is loss of water, excre excretion of water, and natriuresis. Spelling that wrong, but that's excretion of sodium. Okay. And the other thing you do is you have too much extracellular fluid, you're going to decrease the renin angiotensin aldosterone system you get decreased aldosterone so all of this is going to cause increased sodium excretion this this thing does the same thing increased sodium excretion increased water excretion you get normalization of the ECS, ecf volume and that's why you have a euvolemic hyponatremia okay now why would we have too much adh secretion leading to what leading to h2o retention and euvolemic hyponatremia you can either have an ectopic secretion, so something like a small cell lung cancer. Remember, when you say small cell lung cancer, what do we say? This is all super, very, uh, very synthesizing. Remember, we have the three A's here. Small cell lung cancer caused secretion of ACTH, ADH, and then antibodies to the to the calcium receptor, which led to. Um, Blanking on it, it's, it's not. It's uh, what is it? Uh, anyways, it's that one. It secretes antibodies. I'm blanking on the on the name now. Excuse me. That means you have to look it up and and tell me. And okay, so ectopic secretion or from pituitary secretion. This is I remember. This is um. So if you have increased pituitary secretion from either palm, it can be CNS disease, palm disease, or drugs can cause increased pituitary secretion, okay? So what happens? Clinical features, we just said the problem here is you get hyponatremia, what's gonna happen? Hyponatremia is gonna lead to cerebral edema, and then if you get cerebral edema, then you get problems with your brain, you get mental status changes and seizures. So that's that's what can develop. If you have too much of a hyponatremia, you get cerebral edema. edema. Remember, it's basically you have increased, decreased osmotic pressure in your cell, so water goes out into the brain, you get edema. Okay. How do we treat this? Treat the underlying cause and you correct the hyponatremia. So what was the underlying cause? Is when we said either ectopic secretion, so from the small cell lung cancer, or from increased pituitary secretion from CNS problems, pulmonary problems, or drugs like cyclophosphamide. So treat that, then you treat hyponatremia. Too low sodium, what do you do? First, you restrict free water because remember the problem is you're reabsorbing too much water. So if you just don't intake water, you're not going to reabsorb too much water. The other thing you can do is just straight up give them salt tablets or you give them hypertonic saline. You get saline that has very high levels of sodium and that's going to increase the levels of sodium in your, in your blood. And the last thing you can do is you can give them uh, demicocycline. We just said that's an ADH receptor antagonist or a vasopressin antagonist, so that's the Vaptins.
and give democlocycline or the Vaftins to treat this. Now, what was the last thing? What do, what do we have to be careful about when we're treating this? When we're treating the hyponatremia, what do we not want to do? Remember, we do not want to raise the sodium levels too quickly. You need, you need to raise it slowly. What's the problem if you raise it too quickly? Remember the mnemonic. If you go from high to low to high too fast, your pawns will die. Low to high, your pawns will die. Okay? And that's the osmotic demyelination syndrome. Osmotic demyelination syndrome of the pawns. Very bad thing. Um, pawns is essential, so very bad. Remember the opposite of it was you go from high to low, your brains will blow, you get cerebral edema, and you get herniation. Okay. So SADH super high. I mean, this thing is very it's high yield. It's very it integrates a lot of stuff. You see a lot of stuff. You see renal stuff. We have, it's obviously an endocrine problem. You see you see lung stuff. You see neural stuff. So all of this stuff. All right. So that's it for our ADH problems.